Two of the world's biggest mining companies, Anglo American and BHP, have been competing to become the world's next major producer of potash, a commodity that's used in fertilizer across the globe. BHP is now trying to take over Anglo American in a multi billion dollar deal that, among other things, highlights the increasing demand for potash. Today, we're talking with a man who knows potash inside out. Farhad Abbasov is the chairman and director of Millennial Potash, which is in the midst of a major project in the African nation of Gabon. Fahad, welcome to the program. Thank you, Michelle. Your company recently did an in-depth analysis of your project in Gabon, the Banio Potash Project, and it's published a preliminary economic assessment. This report estimates that the project is worth more than one billion US dollars. That's a lot of money. Give us a top-line view, Farhad. Uh, of course, Michelle. Michelle, we've been developing this project in a record time. Yeah, you remember we started with this project in March last year. And since then, we've drilled this project. We've put out made a resource estimate of 1.7 billion tons of indicated and inferred resource. And as recently as, uh, what is it, almost two weeks ago now, we put out our preliminary economic assessment. And the economics look fantastic, as you just mentioned. We have after-tax numbers uh, that really stand out, MPV of over $1 billion, after-tax IRR over 32% as well. And we have one of the lowest cost structures for a potash project out there in terms of CapEx, uh, sustaining CapEx and operating costs. So the analysis um, shows an internal rate of return of more than 30%, which is really at the high end when it comes to potash projects. Farhad, what do you think is driving this high rate of return? So the two factors. One is lower CapEx, um, and that is about $480 million for 800,000 ton a year operation. And, and lower CapEx is due to uh, the use of solution mining technology in terms of extracting and then, of course, processing of potash. And, and also operating costs. Our operating costs are one of the lowest in the world, around $61 per ton. And uh, that is comparable only to the lowest uh, uh, cost producers in the world. And, and that is due to, again, to the, um, to the geology of the deposit. We have one of the thickest deposits in the world, almost 70 meters thick. And that means uh, larger caverns underground when we do solution mining, hence that contributes to lower sustaining capex and operating costs. Again, a very unique project. And that is not even taken into account our potential shipping cost advantages because we're right on the coast of Gabon in West Africa. And Farhad, at current prices, do you expect the Banya project to recoup its costs in under two years? Yes, it's it's a, it's amazing. It's one point four years, Michelle, to be exact, to, to uh, basically recover all the costs. To uh, you know, it's a payback period, and um, and even if the price drops, you know, the, precipitously, we're still going to have a couple of years to uh, actual payback that that uh, initial capex. Um, but the right now, potash price is at one of the lowest points in in history, in the in the recent history, in the last 15, 20 years. So we think that we're in the trough. And, uh, you know, the price should be a lot better than uh, what we have now. But even at the current price, this project is going to be very profitable. Let's dive a little bit more into the cost structure. Your report estimates that you need $480 million U.S. million in capital expenditure to fund the Banio project. Give us an idea of how you would spend this money. Sure, Michelle. So we've looked at three different scenarios. Uh, smaller scale, 400,000 tons, and then 600,000 tons, and then ultimately 800,000 ton a year operation. And what we're talking about here is obviously based on 800,000 tons because it's bigger, it will attract uh, you know, attention of strategics. And we think we can easily place 800,000 tons in the market through our conversations, current conversations with potential off takers. Now, in terms of CapEx, again, um, for 800,000 tons, we're looking at $480 million. And uh, we have three different parts of this operation. One is as I mentioned earlier, or the first stage is a uh, well-filled, brine well-filled. That's when we drill into the deposit. We, uh, we pump uh, salt water into, into the deposit, into the ore body. We dissolve potash, and then we'll pump the brine back up to the surface. So that part, we, what we call brine well-filled, um, or, or you know, solution mining part of the operation. And uh, that is about one-third, uh, or actually one, uh, one quarter of the uh, production uh, cost, meaning of the, of the CapEx. 
Uh, and then after that, once the brine is back at, the, at surface, we actually ship it to processing plant. Now that's where we evaporate water from the brine. Then we separate potash from salt and other elements, other minerals. Uh, and that the processing plant is, is gonna cost us around $190 million. Um, that's the bulk of the cost of the CapEx. And, and then about $100 million will go into infrastructure. That infrastructure includes port loading facilities, storage, the roads and and so forth that, that you know pertain specifically to the project, excluding of course the construction of potential port or anything else. That's uh, that's a completely different thing and that's being done by third parties right now. Um, so that will be about 104 million dollars. And, uh, and finally, we've added 15 percent of contingencies, about 60 odd million dollars on top of that. So we get to 100 or 480 million dollars of capex. So. Um, just to put this in context, uh, Michelle, this is one of the lowest CapEx requirements for the projects, potash projects of this size. If we take a look at your projected operating costs, Farhad, it looks like you can produce a ton of potash for about 60 US dollars. If that figure is accurate, you're looking at a fantastic margin when you sell the product. Potash currently sells for about 300 US dollars a ton. So tell us why do you think you can produce potash so cheaply and whether this can be sustained? Yeah, Michelle, um, this is definitely one of the lowest operating costs out there, primarily because of the geology of the deposit. As I uh, mentioned earlier, we have one of the thickest potash horizons in the world. Again, at the thinnest part, which is the northern part of our project, it's about 70 meters thick. And the, uh, the, uh, the deposit itself dips, it slopes uh, towards the south, so that means that actually it, you know, it becomes much thicker in the south, probably double of that 70 meters. So all of these costs are based on the thinnest part, which is 70 meters. It's still, as I mentioned, one of the thickest in the world. Just to put it in comparison with some other projects worldwide, especially big producing uh, potash basins in the world, let's say in Saskatchewan or in, in, in the Urals uh, in Russia, uh, there, you know, they, they vary between 10, 15, and 25 meters of thickness. Here we got 70 meters um, at the thinnest part. So that is a major contributor uh, to the lower, uh, the lower costs of, uh, you know, lower operating costs. Now, in terms of the, uh, you know, breakdown of that operating cost, you know, probably about a quarter of it is in natural gas, because as I mentioned earlier, when the run comes back up to the surface, we have to evaporate water. So we run it through thermal evaporators which are uh, powered with natural gas. And then another quarter or a third, a third that goes into labor and all the maintenance, et cetera. The rest is, you know, everything else. So the bulk would be, I would say, it's labor and natural gas. And we don't expect the, the cost of natural gas to go, uh, you know, a lot higher than what it's been in the last few years, um, especially considering the Gabon is a major oil and gas producer. So everything will be sourced domestically. And the same thing with labor. Now, obviously a lot of, you know, future inflation has been incorporated into the uh, into the calculations and to the estimate. But at this point, we think, you know, we will be able to achieve that cost. And again, one of the lowest in the world. We've been talking about figures, which are still a preliminary assessment. Do you have any concerns about how the market for potash might change between now and the time when the Banu project comes online? Um, so we always look at um, all kinds of uh, you know repercussions for for our project as well as all kinds of scenarios. And uh, one of the reasons that you know we've been successful in the past, remember this is our third potash project we you know we've built and sold the previous two, is that we always look at the cost structure of the project because there's no way for us to predict how the market is going to change. That means how, how the uh, the price of potash is going to change, what kind of demand there's going to be, and so forth. But we can see what is in the pipeline, of course. We can see what projects are there, which ones uh, do have realistic chance of getting to production. So we do take all of that in consideration. But having said that, we want to make sure that our project can survive even if the potash price comes down. So the way we look at it is the most conservative uh, kind of, uh, you know, the scenario. And in this particular case, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, when you introduced the uh, interview, that BHP is trying to buy uh, Anglo out, and BHP has a large Janssen potash project in Saskatchewan. They've been at it since 2008, if I'm not mistaken. But basically, since the time that we developed our first potash project, uh, Potash One, that, which was also in Saskatchewan, and BHP made a decision to proceed uh, to production with this project uh, a couple of years ago in the middle of COVID, uh, when the potash price went to about $900 per ton. 
if you take potash price today and factor that into their ECF analysis, I assure you that they will have very low IRR. But they've already made that decision, so they're proceeding. So I assume that they will get to production. So uh, our calculations or our plans and strategy at this point are based on the assumption that BHP will eventually get to production in the next two to three years and what will happen to the market then. And we think that it will affect the market in one way or another. Um, but our project, compared to many projects, let alone to BHP's project, will still be a very low cost project. So hence, we think the world project will get to production. Whether it's going to be on our watch, Michelle, or not, that's a different question. But taking into consideration how strong the, uh, the, the cost structure is, the location of the project, the political environment in Gabon, which is probably one of the best in Africa. So we think this will actually proceed, even if, you know, potash environment, uh, you know, deteriorates in the next few years because of BHP's entry. Let's talk about investing, Farhad. Given what you've learned from this latest report, what would you say to investors viewing this who are considering whether or not to invest in millennial potash? Michelle, so I'll answer them probably, or I'll, I'll uh, you know, address them with the with a quote from one of our existing investors, one of the big investors in, in the company who called me from Vancouver after PA come out, came out and told me, look, Farhad, have you um, noticed that you're trading, meaning the company's trading at less than 1% of the NPV? And that's all I can tell the uh, potential investors that this this company is massively undervalued right now. Normally speaking, at this stage, we should be trading at least at five to seven percent of the MPV, but we're you know trading around one percent. So so that shows you how uh, mispriced a lot of projects, a lot of companies, including Millennial Potash, is uh, at this at this stage. And we think that you know we will you know narrow that gap, Michelle, going forward. We think that you know this project will catch up with the the value that it should actually have, hopefully in the next few months. Um, not only because you know the, the investors and potential strategic players will notice the, the the value of the project, but also because we'll continue fast tracking this project further. Music to investors here is massively undervalued. We've been talking about a billion dollar project in the fertilizer sector. Farhad, thanks so much for walking us through the latest economic figures for your project in Gabon. Thank you, Michelle. We've been speaking Take with care. Millennium Potash Chairman Farhad Abbasov, and you've been watching Global One Media's Stocks to Watch. Until next time, I'm Michelle Martin.